Thank you. Uh, I'm Attila de Groot. I work for Kimless Networks. And um, let me see how this works. Um, so uh, what we indeed uh, do, one of our main products is uh, that we build a network operating system. And a net network operating system runs on uh, uh, branded hardware or white box switches, uh, ranging from a Dell as a brand or uh, a white box vendor such as Edgecore. Now our operating system is a Linux operating system. It's based on Debian Jesse. And uh, while uh, running a network operating system uh, on Linux isn't very new, uh, what we specifically do is that we use all the functionality in the Linux kernel uh, itself. So uh, what we did is we added a switching daemon and that switching daemon pushes all the routing and switching information into the uh, ASIC. Um, and uh, that is what it basically makes different. So we don't have any uh, closed uh, uh, packages or uh, closed applications running on top that do all the routing uh, decisions for you. And um, so uh, most of what we develop is uh, upstreamed and is open source. Uh, you can use that uh, by yourself in other uh, applications as well. Um, one of the examples is the bootloader on white box switches. Uh, so the de, uh, de facto standard right now is ONI, uh, which was developed by Cumulus, and uh, that's managed by OCP now. And you can find that basically on every white box that is out there. But also uh, Linux networking development itself. Uh, one of the examples is VRF support in the Linux kernel. Um, you can find that in the most recent versions. Uh, if you want to use it yourself, you can use it uh, starting kernel 4.10. And uh, one of the major things that I'd like to talk about is uh, the fork of Quagga uh, that's called free range routing. Now, uh, what is free range routing for the people who don't know? Um, it is a, a fully open source routing stack. Uh, it is a quark of Faga, uh, uh, <laughs> fork of Quagga, and uh, it uh, supports several protocols uh, like BGP, OSPF, uh, LDP, and uh, now also PIM. It runs on several uh, uh, Linux kernels uh, or Linux distributions and BSD as well. And you can use it in uh, white box platforms such as uh, where we develop uh, the software for uh, or your own routing stack on uh, peering routers if you want to have that cheaper and want to uh, have a full table. Um, or uh, virtual routers in VM solutions if you like. Now, uh, why did we fork this and uh, what is the reason for that? Uh, a fork in open source software is not the uh, best thing to happen. Uh, you always try to prevent it. Um, but in the end, what we uh, wanted, and uh, Cumulus is one of the contributors to, uh, to FRR, is to have a more community-driven uh, development and um, a more fast development as well. Now, uh, who is behind the fork? As I said, we are one of the contributors, uh, but you can see there are a lot of uh, people involved and uh, a lot of companies as well. Um, and they all make their contributions on uh, several protocols. And uh, uh, what is the difference between uh, the Quagga development and now uh, free range routing? Now, as I said, it's more uh, a, a structured way of development. Uh, it all works through GitHub with Git pools uh, and everything, so it's very easy to participate. Um, there's automated testing in there, uh, so uh, that should prevent uh, issues, uh, uh, which you will always see. And it's backed by the uh, Linux Foundation, uh, so uh, there's not a single person in charge or, um, uh, well, that uh, uh, controls all the assets of the uh, uh, project. Now, how can you get it? Um, right now, the stable release is 2.0. Uh, you can get a snap package or uh, packages of uh, several uh, other OSs. Um, I believe that Debian and Ubuntu is ready uh, to download and Red Hat as well. Uh, I think this is uh, older. Um, and other packages will follow as well. Uh, obviously, you can also just uh, uh, clone the Git repository and build it yourself if you'd like to. Um, 
Uh, right now, uh, uh, 3.0, the first release candidate is uh, um, available, and if you want to use that, you can do so. I was talking to one of the developers yesterday, asking what the timeline was for the uh, GA for 3.0, and that's planned for end of this month. Um, and I'll go over what uh, what is all in there. Now, uh, 2.0 was released in April. Um, and the uh, version numbering is because uh, Quagga was in the one train and so they uh, continued with the numbering in 2.0. Um, as far as I've been told there are uh, more than two, uh, 1200 patches between the last Quagga version and the first uh, free range routing release. Um, as you can see, uh, LDP support was added, uh, uh, PIM support for routing uh, or multicast, um, JSON support, uh, unnumbered routing as well for uh, both o OSPF and BGP. So there are a lot of new things. Now the idea was to have a new release and uh, that uh, should have been uh, 2.1 or something. Um, but uh, it seemed that there were so many additions uh, that they decided to go to 3.0. And uh, you can see what uh, was all added. Um, uh, the PIM support was actually in 3.0. Um, uh, and well, ISIS was almost completely rewritten that I have a separate slide uh, about. Um, now, uh, one of the things with uh, PIM is that uh, it was completely included in free range routing, uh, so it uh, integrates with uh, Zebra as well. Um, MSDP uh, wasn't available yet, uh, so that was written as well because that's one of uh, the requirements that you can have in a multicast environment. Uh, ECMP support, um, and one of the things that we use a lot in uh, cu uh, Cumulus deployments is the unnumbered interfaces. Uh, so what you use, and that's available for BGP and OSPF as well, is that you use the V6 link local addressing to set up a neighbor relationship. That basically means that in your infrastructure you don't have to uh, configure any IP addressing on your uh, backbone interfaces, and well, that uh, should help a lot when uh, you want to uh, automate everything. As you can see here in the example, uh, your configuration uh, is much more smaller. You have uh, a lot less variables that you have to uh, actually manage. Now, uh, when I submitted my slides, uh, I got one of the questions like, can you tell us something about ISIS? Because there are a lot of people in South Africa that use ISIS. And well, Cumulus actually didn't uh, develop uh, the ISIS part in, uh, uh, in FR. However, I talked to one of the developers and uh, asked him like, okay, what can I tell here during my presentation? And well, uh, what he said is that he uh, uh, rewrote uh, large parts of the code, and mainly to uh, increase stability, uh, because I've understood that that's an issue when using ISIS in Quagga. <coughs> so uh, the SPF code was completely cleaned up, and it's much more scalable right now. Um, he tested it uh, up until 6K uh, nodes in the network, but he's running into some issues there uh, that they're still looking into. Um, so um, if you have 6K nodes, then uh, you could still run this. Uh, Multi-topology uh, routing support was added. Um, that seems to be one of the things that uh, you'd like to have when uh, you're deploying ISAS. Now, uh, one of the things that's uh, pretty dominant uh, these days, if you look at uh, uh, marketing and uh, data center networking, and that is eVPN. Now, that will be the second part of uh, my presentation, uh, but that will also be included into uh, FR. Uh, this was contributed by Cumulus, uh, but it will be post 3.0 uh, because there will be a lot of features added and also some uh, kernel contributions are needed. Now, if you want to get involved with free range routing, um, uh, it still says here uh, that the w uh, website uh, isn't up. It is up now, but you uh, can have a look. Um, uh, so you can see all the test reports there, uh, get involved in the uh, uh, development of that. Uh, they also have a nice Slack channel. Um, I know that some people still like IRC communication, but 
uh, these days a lot of development is going through Slack. So if you want to uh, uh, contribute to the project, uh, please join and uh, see how you uh, can help them. Now, as I said, one of the things that uh, we run into a lot is uh, overlay networking in uh, specifically data centers. Um, so one thing we've all agreed on is that you want to build an, an uh, IP fabric in your data center. Uh, the only problem is that you still might have some layer two requirements. One could be for your uh, VM infrastructure, and the second because you, uh, your customers are simply uh, expecting it. They are expecting that same VLAN or that same uh, uh, layer two connectivity that they always had in the past. Now, what you can do with an overlay network is uh, uh, you use a VXLAN to uh, build tunnels between your leaf nodes in your network. Now, VXLAN is just a, a standard tunneling protocol. Uh, it encapsulates the original Ethernet frame into a UDP packet, sends it to the destination, and it's uh, decapsulated and sent to the uh, uh, destination host. Um, now, one thing that I'm, uh, or one question that we always get is like, okay, how does that work with hardware support? Um, now, in most hardware these days, VXLAN is uh, supported in hardware. So uh, it can be uh, encapsulated and decapsulated at line rate. Uh, the only thing that you have to keep in mind is that there are no one gig uh, ASICs on the market that uh, support VXLAN encapsulation. So it basically starts at 10 gig with the Trident 2 uh, chipset from Broadcom and uh, also the uh, Mellanox Spectrum chipset and uh, KVM and Bear would do the same as well. Now, if you uh, look at the configuration from a Linux perspective, if you would set up a manual VXLAN tunnel, uh, it would be uh, quite simple. So you have a bridge, and uh, if you're looking at that, then the configuration might seem a bit different because this is a VLAN aware bridge, uh, one of the contributions that, uh, that we made. So you don't have to define a separate bridge for every VLAN that you have. Um, added to that, you have to define a VNI uh, with a source and destination, and basically uh, you can uh, have your tunnels up, and it just works. Now, one uh, issue with that is how do you handle your Mac learning? Um, uh, in the v original VXLAN RFC, it is defined that you do your uh, Mac learning through multicast. Now, uh, the problem is that a lot of uh, networks don't have a, mu a multicast imp uh, implemented. Uh, it could be difficult for the engineers or uh, hardware doesn't support it. Uh, it could be several reasons. Now, most of the hardware also supports uh, a function that they call head-end replication, which basically means that every broadcast or multicast uh, packet is replicated to other nodes. And that is the system that they first uh, used when v uh, VXLAN was implemented. Uh, so every uh, vendor had its own proprietary system. Uh, we had that as well. Uh, so you uh, would only send those uh, replications to the interested nodes. Um, but as you can imagine, that is not really a standard. Uh, so uh, uh, that means that you don't have any interoper interoperability between the vendors. Now, uh, EVPN changes that. Um, and what EVPN does is it uh, builds your overlay network uh, based on BGP. So a lot of the uh, BGP uh, or a lot of data center networks and routing are built on BGP these days. So you're taking the advantage of having an additional address family in BGP to distribute your MAC addressing and your routing information. Now, you have several types of routes that I'd like to go over uh, in a bit. Uh, one of them is the type three uh, announcement. And basically, uh, that is an announcement to announce in uh, which VNIs you're interested in your network. Uh, as I said, uh, you uh, only want to forward bump traffic to uh, the nodes that are, have actually have that VNI configured. So th that is what this uh, basically simple announcement does. It uh, says to the other nodes, okay, I want to have bump traffic for uh, these specific VNIs that I have configured. Now, 
um, the, uh, a type 3 message would basically be sufficient to build all your tunnels and have your network uh, working. But that means that you would still be uh, depending on data plane learning of all your MAC addresses. So you would be back to having the same problem of your layer 2 networks and your broadcast traffic. Now that can be prevented using uh, the eVPN type 2 updates. Um, w because what you can do is you uh, have a MAC IP route ad advertisement because every local node learns the uh, MAC and IP combination of the attached nodes and uh, it does broadcast suppression. Uh, so uh, what you then can do is you have a local proxy ARP running uh, which will reply to the, uh, uh, to the uh, request of the uh, or the ARP request that the node has been sent. That means that um, uh, everything is uh, just suppressed and you don't have all the flooding over your network which should make a layer 2 uh, network more stable and uh, less traffic flooding over it. Um, uh, obviously uh, the, uh, there are a lot of questions about IPv6 at these forums. Uh, it, this is also valid for IPv6 neighbor discovery. If you enable broadcast suppression, you do have to keep in mind that uh, there could be legacy applications where um, uh, uh, th that are using some broadcast messages that are simply dropped because uh, they are suppressed. So that is something that you have to keep in mind. But I would advise to just migrate or phase away those uh, old applications and replace them by something new. Now one of the uh, things uh, in eVPN also is the Mac mobility uh, because uh, one of the uh, use cases that you have is where you do a VM movement from one hypervisor to the other. And what you can basically do is you have a counter, a Mac mobility counter that you can increment as soon as a Mac movement uh, takes place. So if the VM is moved, uh, it will send a gratuitous ARP and uh, the counter is uh, uh, updated and uh, all the nodes know where that uh, MAC address is now uh, added uh, so the uh, traffic will be fo uh, forwarded accordingly. Now then we come to a difficult topic, uh, routing in VXLAN uh, because pretty much everyone here uh, for like the past 15 years has been co uh, configuring an SVI in their VLAN and you expect it to be uh, routed. Um, one issue is that a lot of people don't realize that when VLANs just started with hardware support you couldn't route inside it so you didn't have an SVI. And basically for the Trident 2 chipset for example that's still the case so with VXLAN. Uh, because uh, you can't uh, do the routing function uh, after you have uh, encapsulated or decapsulated a VXLAN packet. So that means that if you wanted to do routing in VXLAN, you need to do that with routing on a stick or firewall on a stick. Well, you can imagine how that would look like in your data center for uh, the traffic flows because it will be tromboning uh, all the way over a network, even if you have the same VNI locally configured on a node. Now, for that, um, uh, routing uh, in VXLAN was added to several chipsets, um, uh, and I'll get back to that in a bit. And you can implement that in several ways. Now, uh, one of the ways is centralized routing, um, and basically what you do is instead of um, yeah. Uh, instead of configuring the SVIs on a uh, firewall on the edge, you have a centralized routing where you configure the SVIs on a central node. Now that still means that you have the traffic tromboning, um, so you have to look at uh, do I want to use that and how do my traffic flows look like. If you have a lot of, uh, or uh, if you don't have a lot of east-west traffic and just traffic going uh, to the outside world, then this could be a solution. Now another solution uh, would be to have any cast routing uh, because what you can basically do is uh, since you have control over the MAC and IP updates in eVPN, you can configure the same SVI IP address or the same gateway for your nodes on every uh, local host. Which means that uh, you can route locally um, and east-west traffic uh, doesn't even pass through your spines or leaf layers. Um, now, uh, one of the uh, issues uh, here is how do you then do your layer 3 uh, routing? Now, uh, basically you have asymmetric and symmetrical routing. 
And uh, with uh, asymmetrical routing, uh, that means that uh, you want to route in a different subnet, um, but with uh, you need to configure the VNI everywhere because uh, it could be that there is a destination that uh, needs to be reached and uh, what it does, it uh, encapsulates the original uh, IP packet and it will send it to the destination uh, where it only has to be decapsulated. So there is no secondary IP lookup if you want to do that. Now that's the difference with symmetrical routing. Uh, because with symmetrical routing there are actually two IP lookups. One at the local node uh, where it will do an IP lookup and uh, one at the remote load uh, uh, destination where it has to uh, go into the correct VLAN again. Now as I said hardware uh, dependencies are always an issue. Um, uh, VXLAN routing uh, for Broadcom chipsets is uh, supported on the Trident 2 Plus uh, series. Um, it is also supported on the Maverick chipset. Uh, the Maverick chipset is uh, basically a uh, more energy efficient version of the Trident 2 Plus. Um, it is supported on the Tomahawk uh, series as well but not natively. Uh, so I put a few dots in there uh, because uh, we've implemented it as such but basically what you do is you uh, enable a loop on the ASIC um, and that also causes you to lose two physical ports on the front and a typical box has 3200 gig ports um, and that means that you have uh, less ports available but you would still be able to do VXLAN routing. Now Tomahawk Plus, um, that is a new chipset from Broadcom um, uh, and basically it will include VXLAN routing as well. And the Spectrum chipset uh, from Mellanox, uh, which uh, Cumulus supports as well, that does VXLAN routing as well. A small note though, um, they have two different versions of the Spectrum, the A0 and A1. And uh, A0 can only do asymmetrical routing, where A1 can do uh, also symmetrical routing. So if you want to do layer 3 uh, multi tenancy, then uh, uh, the Spectrum A1 is uh, the best choice though for that. Now, uh, as I said, for um, uh, symmetrical routing, uh, it goes a bit further. Uh, you do uh, uh, both the IP lookups, uh, so you could uh, 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 or compare it a bit with a layer 3 VPN uh, because it has the same functionalities. You can sh uh, have different overlapping uh, or overlapping subnets as well. And um, uh, you don't need to configure a VNI on every node. So you can just have a few VRFs, uh, do your routing in there and it will do the lookups. Now, um, uh, okay, that's basically uh, what is in, on this slide uh, because you uh, can configure the VRFs uh, uh, locally and you can have the overlapping subnets, something that everyone is uh, basically aware of. Now, uh, what I wanted to accomplish with this um, uh, with this presentation, uh, well, with free range routing, uh, there's more structured development, uh, new features and pr uh, protocols, and uh, one of the things is, uh, or one of the advantages of open networking is that it's not just related to. <coughs> uh, to the network nodes itself, you can also include hosts. So uh, I've made a, a simple diagram here uh, which would ex uh, assume that you have VRFs and EVPN all the way down to the host. So what you could do is you have uh, different container setups or a VM setup and you do your tenant separation all the way down to the host. Now, Technically you could do that already, uh, but it has a lot of dependencies on kernel versions, on network manager, etc. Um, but that means that the uh, open source development and open networking development has advantages for both the network and the operating systems itself. Now for EVPN VXLAN, uh, I've showed um, uh, pictures and diagrams of typical data center setups, but it doesn't mean that it's uh, limited to a uh, data center spine leaf topology. Since you can do uh, layer 3 separation, you could also use it in small service provider environments. So if you, uh, if your only requirement is layer 3 um, uh, separation, uh, uh, to have layer 3 VPNs, have a look at this. Uh, so if you, uh, if that's the only reason to use MPLS for example. 
Um, so yeah, uh, that is basically the uh, advantage for eVPN and uh, in combination with the open sourcing of it. Now, with re uh, relating to open source, we have uh, quite a large community. Um, also for Cumulus, everything goes uh, through a, a Slack channel. We have about 800 users uh, these days. Uh, feel free to join as well. Um, and uh, what we also have is we have a, virtu a virtualized version um, and you, these days you can even click on the website and it spins up an entire topology. Can we all have a few questions please? I think it's such an interesting talk and such an interesting principle um, that there must be begging questions. If you don't mind, it's yeah, here. Of course. Um, I know you're all um, craving the food that's out there in the foyer there, but you actually don't look too hungry to me. So. Give him a couple of minutes. Uh, thanks, Alan. Hi, uh, Mark Tinker, Seacom. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's really good. Um, I was interested in the state of ISIs uh, in, in, in the system, uh, particularly because, as you said, uh, the Huagda's implementation is not very good. And we found ourselves in positions where we have to uh, work with OSPF um, and, you know, on servers uh, to get that into um, the ISIS core. Um, so what's the implementation like? And you said it's being rewritten from scratch. Is, uh, is it promising? So, um, I, as I said, we did indeed the de development ourselves, um, but uh, the developer to uh, told me that um, the scalability is uh, much better. Um, and if you want to build it yourself right now, he uh, said, okay, please use the uh, release candidate one um, because uh, he made so many changes that he said uh, that is the best way to go for now. Uh, but if you have really specific ISIS questions, then I would suggest to uh, join the Slack channel. Uh, the few developers are there and uh, they are better capable of answering them. Um, if you don't mind, I just have a quick question. <clears throat> um, if, you can, if I can sh see by a show of hands, who of you uh, procure hardware, all your hardware, or the majority of your hardware through local distributors? Who of you import your hardware from overseas? Who of you use hardware that you feel is actually compatible with an open network operating system such as this? Very interesting. Sorry. Hello, Rian from AIS. Um, EVPN, I noticed you got VXLAN there. Eh? Mm -hmm. Any PPP functionality that is not mentioned? Um, uh, I know that uh, there is a pos or an extension uh, or one of the drafts, I believe, uh, yeah. to include PPP. Um, but we haven't done any development on that. And to be honest, I don't know the details about it. Okay. That. Not even uh, planning or anything like that. Um, not that I've uh, heard of. Okay, that's fine, thank you. So there were actually quite a lot of hands of people that acknowledged their hardware is Cumulus compatible. I didn't ask the question, who's actually using Cumulus in South Africa? <laughs> not enough, it seems like. Uh, do you want to give us any comments on your experience, Malcolm? Hi, I'm Malcolm, Michelle's assistant <laughs> troublemaker. Um, yes, we deployed the Cumulus VX uh, into our, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, we've got a, quite a cool dev environment, and we set up a spine leaf architecture using the, the Cumulus, running all sorts of different protocols, including OSPF and ISIS as the, the sort of backplane layer three. And all the tests that we've done is, have shown that uh, it's pretty easy to do, um, quite useful actually in terms of uh, getting a uh, sort of a, a very nice product out there that isn't so expensive compared to some of the other big brand names out in the market. And uh, yeah, it, again, if you've got, if you've got any questions, their, their forums and their, and their Slack channel is quite a useful place to be. Thanks. Um, I, I heard a story last night that Facebook came to Cumulus and said, well, we're building a network switch that has 120 
hundred gigabits. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah, so the, the, I didn't include it in the slides because I have some nice photos of it. But uh, we also have support for the Facebook backpack, and it has one hundred and twenty-eight hundred gig ports. And it's basically an open model. So what you have with uh, typical uh, chassis models, they have uh, network CPUs, and uh, uh, it's uh, specifically designed by a vendor. And Facebook opened it, uh, the design up for the OCP, and uh, well, uh, we're running on that as well. And so uh, it's open hardware and open source software, and a network switch that does. 128 times 100 gigabits. Yeah. Amazing. Well, actually, there's a new one from Edgecore, and that has either 265 or 500 and 1200 gig ports. <laughs> <sighs> well, I guess that's more than enough for Africa. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, Atia. Very much. Uh, uh, thank you so much for coming here. No pre we very much appreciate your presence yeah. and teaching us about how things work in the real world. And um, no problem. Here, this is one of our mascots. Oh, beautiful. Okay, <laughs> Cumulus is a turtle. That's uh, not quite what comes to mind. Uh, thank you, Atiyah.